Good evening. I'm Major Nigel Bubby, Vice Chair of the Christian Evidence Society. Welcome to Questions of Our Times. Tonight's question is, is God really listening? My guest today was once described as the cleverest man in the Church of England. After an academic career that included being a dean at Cambridge and an Oxford professor, he was appointed Bishop of Monmouth. In 1999, he was elected Archbishop of Wales. Three years later, he was consecrated Archbishop of Canterbury. And in so doing, he became the holder of two unique distinctions. Firstly, he was the first non-Church of England clergyman to hold that position since the Reformation. And, to date at least, he is the only Archbishop of Canterbury to have been arrested for his hymn singing. I should just point out, though, that that accolade was conferred not during Evensong, but while taking part in a protest at a US Air Force base. Having then served the Global Anglican Communion, in 2013, he returned to university life as Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge. Also in 2013, he returned to the House of Lords, having been appointed a crossbench peer in his own right. Last year, he relinquished his seat on the red benches and today he is Honorary Professor of Contemporary Christian Thought at the University of Cambridge. A multilinguist, a prolific author, an inspirational poet, and an insightful thinker, here to talk with me today about prayer and spirituality is the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Lord Williams of Oystermouth, Dr Rowan Williams. Rowan, good evening. So lovely good to evening, see you. Nigel. What is the, thank you so much for the invitation and for the chance to be with you. Thank you. Um, Ryan, we're talking about prayer and spirituality tonight. So I notice, and perhaps you've noticed it as well, there's been a trend in recent years for people to describe themselves more as being a spiritual person than as being a religious person. Is there a difference between the two? Or, and if so, with, well, what is the difference? Hmm. I guess that when people say they're spiritual or not religious, the main thing they want to do is to say they're not particularly keen on religious institutions. They don't want to sign up. They don't want to be involved with an institution which often looks as if it's creaking a bit at the seams. But they're aware that there's something they want to relate to that isn't just the rational world around them. The problem is, I think, that very often that can mean, well, I'm looking for something that makes me feel spiritual but I don't much want to be involved with other human beings in that quest or with a tradition or a discipline, a community. And I suppose that's where I, I have some questions about this trend. I'd, I understand the feeling people want to step back a bit from the institutions, but I think we've got to be a bit careful about how we use the word spiritual, especially since in the Bible, words around spiritual and spirit almost always mean something to do with connection with relationship. So if it's just an individual thing, it's perhaps not really cutting the mustard. So is it a, um, is it a reflection of a, of a sort of more, a society that has moved more or is moving more towards individualism than the notion of society and community? Yeah, I think, I think it is. It's certainly a, an index of that trend in our society. And it's not something that can be ignored because again, there's a, a valid thing here. People want to say, well, it's no use you're talking to me about a religious set of beliefs that don't somehow correspond to the world I know I live in and the questions I know I'm asking. And when people say that too much time is spent by churches giving perfect answers to questions that nobody is asking, you know, we, we do have to think hard about that. Yeah. So I've got some sympathy, but equally, if the Christian faith means anything, it does mean a real challenge to individualism and asking people to step outside their comfort zone there. Yeah, on the question of individualism then, how, is it possible for a person to be a Christian without going to church and without belonging to a community? It's a complicated question really, isn't it? Mm. If, if we just say, oh, well, you, know, you can be as good a Christian if you don't go to church as if you do, then people will say, what exactly then is the point of all this palaver that goes on on Sunday mornings. <laughs> if you say, oh, well, nobody can be a Christian without going to church, people will immediately say, well, I know so-and-so, who's a wonderful person who seems to be attuned to 
to God in various ways, you're not telling me they're not a Christian, are you? So I don't particularly want to get into a dogfight over that. What I'd want to say is what's given to us as Christians is the possibility of living in a healing community, a community of trust, a community of hope. That trust and hope are refreshed, not only every week, but every day when we together come into the presence of God. And without that, the springs are just going to run dry sooner or later. Yeah. Of course, there are times in some people's lives when they feel they can't cope with, with church for all mm -hmm. kinds of reasons. They may have abusive, difficult experiences of church. Mm -hmm. They may find it just doesn't connect with them. And yet they're still trying to keep themselves open. I'm not going to excommunicate them. Yeah. But I think yeah. that for most of us, we really do need that regular exposure to listening to the Bible being read praying together, being quiet together, just letting God be and doing that together, doing that in the company of others who trust God. Thank you. To what extent then is religion or even spirituality, if we keep those as two separate concepts, to what extent are they um, a human antidote to the concept of human morality, a way of coping with or even denying the fact that life is short and that one day we will die? One thing that religious faith isn't is a denial of mortality. We're always being reminded that we're limited beings. Our religious faith tells us we're not infinite, we're not God, and we don't have to be. It's all right to have limits, and death is one of those limits that we have to come to terms with. The good news for Christian believers is that because of the God we believe in, death is not a full stop. It's a an unimaginably great transition in a journey that continues, not because a little bit of us survives, but because God doesn't give up on us and God holds us in and through and beyond death. So yes, you could say it's a way of coping with mortality, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not a way of denying it. And you might say that really one of the problems in our, our secular world is that a lot of people deny their limits, deny their mortality, mm. don't want to think about death, and just generally run from it into, yeah. into the present moment. So at least yeah. we can say of religious faith, we're trying to be honest about the fact that we are, we are organisms that are running down. Mm. We, we are liable to disease and tragedy. Mm. And yet there is holding us mm. an energy, a force and a love that will not let go. So really the Christian is saying, or the Christian faith is saying, now is not forever. Hmm. That's right. And the Christian is also saying, yes, we're all doomed, but don't panic. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Mannering. <laughs> Always a private phrase. Uh, right, <laughs> let's, um, uh, let's look at our question then tonight. Is, is God really listening? Now that assume, that's got some assumptions, of course. Uh, hmm. Purposely, it's got some assumptions. That's why I posed it. But it assumes the existence of God. Karl Marx saw religion as, as a pacifying opiate of the masses, a, a means of control. Sigmund Freud saw God as a, as a wish fulfillment. Uh, Dawkins, uh, um, Richard Dawkins uh, famously sees God as, as a delusion. Now, what evidence can you offer those people who might think that Dawkins, Marx, Freud, and other thinkers have got a point. What evidence can you offer that, that God really does exist? The first thing to say is, of course, that the existence of God just isn't something you can give a cast iron proof for in the way that you might prove, I don't know, the existence of um, electrons, hmm. or whatever, or indeed the existence of some um, unimaginably obscure and remote animal or insect species, because God isn't an item inside the world that you can go looking for. Mm. You have to step back a bit and say, so what exactly are we trying to say? And what the religious believer says is that behind every action, every transaction and exchange of energy, every event in the world, there is something that is unconditionally active Nothing made it to be active. It's not reacting to anything. It's simply there and all action is stimulated by that. And oddly enough, modern science 
allows us a bit more leeway there than some older kinds of science might have done. If you just think the world is a great heap of stuff lying around, then you might well say, okay, perhaps the stuff was always lying around. If you see the world as a great interchange of energy, if you see it as an exchange of information constantly buzzing and sparking between different bits of hugely and unimaginably complex reality, then the question of, well, where does all that energy find its root, its impulse? That makes a bit of sense. I don't think there's a cast iron argument there, but that's one way I'd sort of introduce the idea, reminding people of what often um, somebody like Richard Dawkins doesn't seem to remember, which is that we're not talking about a God who is just one more thing among others, a rather unusual member of the universe. Second thing I just want to say very briefly is I'd want to put Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, Dawkins, all the others put their work alongside what it is that Christians over the centuries have actually said about God and say, well, when you've mapped, let's say, Karl Marx onto that, it covers a very small territory of what Christians actually say. Yeah. And there's all the rest of it. And then Freud covers another little bit of the territory and Dawkins another little bit of the territory, mm. but none of them quite seems to get the whole thing. If religion is just something we've invented to keep us cheerful, why is it that religious practice is so deeply demanding? Why do people risk their lives for it? If religion is just a consolation for, um, for the fact of our death, why is it that religious faith so often tells us it matters intensely how we react to one another and to our world here and now, day by day? and so on. So you can throw all sorts of reproaches at the language of faith, but none of them quite seem to cover the whole territory. There's always something that escapes. Well, yeah, you, you, you can, it's, I mean, it's always easier to be against something than it is to be yep. for something, isn't it? And, 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 and um, it, there are some easy targets. Yes, yes. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, the God delusion uh, book by Dawkins does actually pick on easy targets and, yes. and, and, and and many um, right-minded, fair-minded people will say, oh, he's got a point there, because it, mm. it shouldn't have to be like that. But that, but being against something isn't the same as offering, as you are suggesting, a, a, I believe, you know, a comprehensive mm. alternative narrative that yes. deals with the deeper issues of human personality and destiny. Yes, that's right. And that, I think that's also why you know, relatively few people accept Christian faith or any religious faith because they've been argued into it. Yeah. They see lives that appear to work. They see lives that hang together and have a bit of sense and meaning to them. And they think sometimes, you know, I wouldn't mind living in that kind of world that that person seems to occupy. I wonder what it's like. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not a short task. You can't say, all right, I'll deal with that in a quick course of six seminars, you can say, well, hang around, see what you pick up, take some risks, yeah. open your imagination a bit, mm. and you never quite know what will happen. C.S. Lewis, yeah. probably the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century, famously said, and rather daringly said, God is really unscrupulous. Give him an inch and he'll take a mile. If you open even the smallest door, you never quite know how much he's going to push himself through. I'd like to talk about what you think God is like in a minute, but but where you speak there about how people are not argued hmm. into a faith position, but they see somebody else. You're you I, I, I'm sensing a link. I, I don't want to put words into your mouth, of course, but I'm sensing a link that, but a person's belief should demonstrate itself. Hmm consciously or subconsciously through their behavior and their attitudes and their characteristics mm. and their character and their personality. Is, is that the way you see it? It has to be so, doesn't it? Because mm. when we read in the New Testament about faith, it's most definitely not, as we might just perhaps mistakenly think, something going on in your head. Mm. Faith is an attitude of trust which pervades your relationships. Mm. And that second phrase, pervades your relationships, is the key thing an attitude of trust towards God, which makes you a different kind of human being. Hmm. 
And if it doesn't make you a different kind of human being, you might need to go back and ask, what exactly is it I'm, I think I'm trusting? Or yes. how, how yeah. deeply do I trust? Yeah. Which is why you know, the old quarrel between faith and works in Christian mm. history, are we saved by one or the other, is a bit of a red herring. Because it's quite clear in the New Testament that yes, we, we are not brought to be at one with God by our own efforts and our own successes, mm. only by the gift of God. And that's what we have to trust. But, as I say, trusting in that way makes us a different sort of person. And that is a visible testimony. And, and again, I, I, I'm sensing a, you're differentiating between, say, knowing facts mm. about the Bible or about this character of Jesus or, or the patriarchs or mm. the Mosaic law. Yeah. There's a difference between knowing facts and committing a faith. Yes, Yes. You've used the word relationship a couple of times. I have indeed, and uh, very deliberately so, because <laughs> quite clearly in the New Testament, when Jesus says to his, his disciples, follow me, mm. he doesn't first say, you know, consider this set of propositions and just get back to me by email. He mm. says, <laughs> come and spend time in my company, build a relationship. And out of that, comes the system of what we call Christian doctrine or Christian theology. People have been spending time in the company of Jesus with the, the narrative of Jesus, with the spirit of Jesus in the life of the community. And bit by bit, they work out how to put the jigsaw together of what then must be true of God if this is the sort of thing that happens. Okay, we've gone back to God. Let's, what must be true about God? I mean, again, if we look at our question tonight, you know, um, is God truly listening? Mm. That there, one of the other assumptions there is that actually God is something, someone with whom we can communicate. Mm. You know, if if God were inanimate, if he if he were uh, as some cultures would have, you know, a tree or a totem or a stone or a statue or whatever, the question of communicating a two way mm. communication would be would would yeah. be. Um, Illogical. Yes. yes. So, so my question to you then, Rowan, is what's God like? Any human being who tried to answer that would, I think, be risking blasphemy or nonsense if they tried to give a definitive answer. And I do mean that very seriously. Mm. But what we know of God is, of course, what God tells us. Yeah. What God tells us in for Christians in the stories of the Old and New Testaments and the events that underlie those stories is at least two things, and of course lots more, but at least two. One is that what, what people encounter and talk about as God is a reality that is faithful, dependable. The God we meet in the Bible is a God who commits himself to being there for the world. A God also who doesn't give up on us when we fail or even when we turn away and rebel. A God who can be absolutely relied on to be there for us. It's the first thing. Second thing, obviously following from that, is that we cannot, it seems, imagine a God whose nature is less than ours a God who is less intelligent, less loving, less purposive. If the world God has made is a world which moves all the time towards intelligence, loving relation, purpose, and so forth, we can't really imagine that the energy that starts and sustains all this is somehow less than that. So when I try to express this, I often say, the language of God as personal is the best we can do because the love and intelligence we associate with personal life and that we value in personal life is you know, sort of the, the best we can do in imagining yeah. um, the kind of life we most, we most value, we most, I was going to say admire, which isn't quite the right word. Mm -hmm. But that, in that sense, we can't think of God as being less than that. So faithfulness, intelligence, love, these, these are the things which seem to come into focus here. And that mechanism, that mechanism 
of not being able to think of of a being who is less than us is is that in any way linked with the concept in in genesis that says that humankind is made in the image of god very much so yes yes and people have argued and reflected all through the centuries on what exactly those mysterious words mean that we're made in god's image but some of the, the best shots at this have been when people say the very best, the freest and most generous capacity in us for relation, in love and in intelligence and so forth, that must somehow be the point at which we have a, what I've sometimes called a, a kind of magnetic needle sort of hovering in the direction of God. Still on the concept of talking uh, and, and or being listened to mm. by the by by God, apart from sheer human arrogance, why would people think that the Creator of the whole universe is personally interested in us and is prepared to help us sort out our problems when we ask Him? Primarily, I think it's a matter of reminding ourselves that if God really isn't just another very important bit of the universe, then God doesn't, so to speak, have to choose what he pays attention to. God doesn't have to choose between the big events and the small events or the big phenomena and the small phenomena. God is present, working, listening, speaking in everything, at the root of absolutely everything. In the Old Testament, this is particularly seen in terms of what's called the wisdom literature, that somehow the the deep structure and logic of the, the things of the world is where God is always at work. And oh, can I just clarify the wisdom literature? So this is oh, Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, yes, yes. Song of Solomon. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And in that in that context, you can perhaps see that God doesn't have to have his attention drawn to things. God is just mm -hmm. there, and because God is not confined as we are by time and space, hmm. there's sort of not a problem for God getting over a vast distance to come to us or turning his attention from one thing to another. And of course, we can't imagine it. This is why I say it's, it's folly to think we can say comprehensively what God is like. Yeah. We, we can say, I have no idea what it would be literally like to be God. Hmm. God forbid hmm. that we should. But <laughs> we can say, if God really is, as we say he is, that, that endless, free, loving energy that's not confined by the world, well, we can at least begin to glimpse why God isn't going to have the problem that we might have in trying to attend to several billion people at once. It's not that kind of reality we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I'm interested that you have used the word loving when you've, when you've, when you've, um, brushed or tangentially uh, definitions. Uh, earlier, you said that some of the elements are faithfulness, loving, or love, and intelligence. You just used the word loving in relationship mm. to, to God there. I was looking at the World Health Organization figures at uh, tea time today. Uh, one point, sorry, 123.4. That's one, two, three point four million people in the world have contracted COVID. Two point seven million people have died. How can an all loving God, who Christians also believe is all powerful, allow human suffering on such a dreadful scale? No theoretical answer to this has ever really worked. That has to be said honestly right at the beginning. And for people right in the middle of suffering, you know, they, don't want, they don't want theology, they don't want theories. Hmm. So how do we cope with it? First of all, God has made a world in which all kinds of different streams and strands of causation are at work, different streams of cause and effect. How they all work, we don't fully know. We're not bad. We're, we're getting better at it all the time as we become more attuned to the scientific structures around us. In such a world, there are 
you might say, inevitably going to be collisions. People walk into, walk into things, literally or, or metaphorically. Circumstances arise which create conditions which, if human beings are in their path, can be fatal. You might say a great storm out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean might be neither here nor there. Bring it a few hundred miles further east or west and you have a tsunami and a massive loss of life. Question then is, do we imagine a God who is constantly stepping in to prevent disaster? A God who is always, if you like, recalibrating the world that he's made. And at what point is there a sort of cutoff where God says, well, that's, you know, that's a bit a bit too minor for me to adjust mm. or mm. to avoid. So I don't know the answer, but I, I start there by thinking, well, God has made this kind of world and God, in what some people would call his humility, has stepped back to say, this world has to, has to work itself out, has to work according to its own rules and regularities. But then the next thing is that God does not leave the world without his presence, without his action, but it's an action that constantly comes through what he's made. And part of that action, coming really to the, the business of tonight, part of that action is our own prayer. We are told that if we try to open our hearts and minds to God, we are making ourselves a little bit of a channel for God to make a difference. And yeah. that's why I think the answer to if there is ever an answer to this appalling question, is somewhere in that area. It's also something, something to do with, with us. We are trying to make a path for God's action to come into whatever circumstances we're praying about, make a path into the heart of the tragedy and the terror that's around us. And we may not have a theory, but we have a calling. Yeah. Rowan, you you like um, like me as as a, as a pastor have come face to face with human tragedy and suffering, and and you have been with people in times of severe personal crisis, and people have people have prayed. They've prayed for healing, if not for themselves, then they have prayed for healing for their child, mm. for a loved one, yeah. and that loved one has died. Mm. And, and yet somebody else's child has survived. Uh, th these, these are ugly realities of life. Yeah. And sometimes the prayer is not answered. Their faith, their hopes are dashed. Yeah. And again, I bring you back to the fact that you describe God as loving. Now, mm. how does, why does God, you know, have you said some of the, or sorry, you are, I'm hearing you say that actually sometimes we have a part to play in answering prayer there are some things outside of our gift and Rowan, why doesn't god answer prayer when it's not on the global scale of tsunamis mm. but it's on the personal and the, and it will happen tonight in a hospital somewhere in the world a parent will be pleading their heart out to the lord yes. to save their child and by the morning their child will have died yes the difficulty that arises i think if we if we press that too hard is you do end up with asking God or expecting God, so to speak, to make choices and say, well, I'll, I'll heal that one and I won't heal that one. And I'm not sure that that's very consistent with the God of love we're talking about. I don't know why some prayers are followed by healing and some are not. But the only clue I have is in the Gospels. Jesus, Romo goes to his hometown and has a very difficult time there. They don't accept him, they threaten him, and he leaves. And the Gospels tell us he couldn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Now, that's a very odd phrase, isn't it? Because you'd think, oh, Jesus can do what he likes. But it's as if there were being reminded 
exactly how much can change in any given set of circumstances. We don't know. We don't know, so to speak, how, how large the window of opportunity is for the action, the loving action of God to come through. All I know for certain is that in such a circumstance, I must do the best I can to be one of those channels for the loving action of God. Mm. In, my, in my actual behavior, in what I do, and in my prayer. Whether that is enough to change the whole circumstance, I don't know. I never know how much difference is made, but I know I have to do it. I, I, I understand, I understand, and, and, and many uh, Christians would feel the same, that, that, that sometimes we, we don't know what we can do, but we know we can pray, and, and we believe that prayer is somehow um, not magically disappearing the, the problem, not, not necessarily <laughs> resulting in that, in that um, magic or that mm. miracle, but it is, it's a sign that God's presence is there, whatever the outcome. But yes, and, and I think very often what people will to some extent understand in those circumstances is if your own willingness to be alongside them becomes a sign for them that God is alongside them, that they're not forgotten, they're not alone. It's not everything, but it's not nothing. No, no, indeed. But, but doesn't, you know, if, if, if my child isn't healed, and, and I'm a believer, and my non-believer neighbour, who he, he, he or she would never darken the doors, maybe they take the name of the Lord in vain, and their child is healed. Um, you know, God just does come across as a bit capricious, as a bit as a bit as a bit choosy. I know you say you don't want to make him make choices, mm -hmm. um, but if if in in my deepest sorrow, my deep our deepest need, God does not appear to answer my prayer. A, what's the point of praying? And B, what's the point of God? Mm -hmm. God isn't there as a, as a problem solver. Mm. And that's, you know, it's a hard thing to say. And I wouldn't say it in those terms in, in the kind of pastoral situation you're talking about, the last mm. thing I'd say. Mm. Mm. But God is there as the reality which undergirds everything, as the lover, the father who lets go of nothing and no one the one whom death does not defeat. Death happens, but it doesn't defeat or exclude the act of God. And all of that, which I think is for me summed up in the belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of that helps me just a little bit to sit alongside the, the desperate, bereaved person and, and simply say with as much conviction as I can Master, you really are not forgotten. Yeah. If, if God is there, God is not forgetting, God is not turning away, God is not saying no, it'll feel like that. Don't, and don't be afraid of saying so. Don't be afraid of expressing the bewilderment, the anger, the, the wretchedness, the sense of betrayal. Don't be afraid of saying it. God can cope. But beyond that, just try to hang on to the the notion that God does not let go. How do you think prayer works? Some people think that it might be like a you know a lot buying a lottery buying a lottery ticket. The more you say, the more the chances are you that your ticket your number is going to come up uh, and you're going to hit the jackpot. Is it? Uh, some people think of it as a bit like a shopping list or a, a wish list. You know, write out your list for Santa. Have you been naughty? Have you been good? You know, um, how, how do you see prayer? Mm. As, as a mechanism, I mean, not just as a discipline. Yeah. All of us grow and change in our practice of prayer. Probably most of us, when we first learn about prayer, learn about it as asking God for things in a very simple way. Mm. Mm. And some people who find that they don't always get what they want when they pray give up very quickly. Mm. But others find that what's happening when they genuinely try to stand in the presence of God and speak with him or let themselves be spoken to, find that there's something in that moment that so deepens their awareness, their relationship once again, that they want to carry on. They become perhaps less and less inclined to present a shopping list, more and more inclined just to 
to name the problem, the difficulty, and put it into the hands of God, and more and more inclined just perhaps to, to sit and gaze. The tradition of Christian meditation and contemplation, which we often forget about, just so, wonder, wonder, love, and praise. Yeah. So, so when we say uh, in our question tonight, is is God listening? Mm -hmm. I'm hearing you now say that an element of prayer is us listening. Very much so. Very much so. Um, a friend of mine who often talks about this like to uh, allude to one of the. Uh, the old goon show scripts back in the 1950s someone picking up the telephone and saying hello 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 who's that hello hello who's that who's speaking and the voice at the other end says you are <laughs> we, we need to to stop nattering away and just filling up the space with mm. noise and fuss and anxiety and well our own, and, our own agenda the need to slow and in a way Thank you. And, and in a way, doesn't that actually tie in with the concept of spirituality? It's about mindfulness. It's about being aware of the world. It's communing with the world. It's, it's just mm. that sense of awe yes. and wonder yes. Yes. And, and place in the massive universe. That's right. And what seems to me to be the difference between that and just trying to be spiritual in a very general way is... When you pray in that spirit, in that meditative open spirit, you're saying to God, look, I'm not quite sure what you want to do with me, but here I am. Just let me soak in your will, your presence, your purpose. Just let that difference be made. I've sometimes compared it to rather irreverently to being on a sunbed. You know, you just put yourself where the rays can come at you and make a difference. <laughs> Not nice that I reach. climb on Sunday. But <laughs> that's what they tell me. But the, the point okay. is, you're, you're trying so to open up to God yeah. that bit by bit, a difference is made. You're putting yourself in the way of a blessing, aren't you? You're putting yourself in the way of a blessing, exactly that. And for that to happen, you do need to park some of your agenda, some of your, or some of the stuff that often sounds and feels like a little hamster racing around a wheel you know the yeah um, endless yeah. fuss and fear and self-regard you're trying to be liberated from that just for a, just for a moment yeah uh, rowan you i described you earlier in the introduction as somebody once said you were the cleverest man in the church of england um <laughs> i'm not going to ask you to defend that uh, that hypothesis Good um <laughs> nevertheless I, i'm just looking through the list here you you've earned doctorates from t the uk's two leading universities that's oxford and cambridge just in case anybody's in any doubt uh you hold more than a dozen honorary doctorates from other seats of learning you are a fellow of the british academy of the royal society of literature and of the learned society of wales why does a learned man like you pray to adore my creator and redeemer, to thank God for his gifts, to beg forgiveness for my sins, mm. and to ask that somehow my words and thoughts will be a vehicle for God to heal in the world more widely, to bring to God what most weighs on my heart. Learning in this, this particular context, learning has absolutely nothing to do with it. Well, maybe it will for this question then, Rowan, because uh, it, it's the viewer's chance now. Oh, my goodness, have they been busy. But let's start with an easy one. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Williams, what is evil? Did God create evil? And if not, where did it come from? Very fundamental question. Yep. Evil is, according to the, the greatest Christian minds who have thought about this, evil is the malfunctioning of the world. There isn't a, a stuff called evil, there isn't a thing called evil, but evil is things getting tangled, things going wrong, things not working as they ought. And when human beings are not working as they ought, then because human beings have such intelligence and power, the wrongness can be even more destructive than in, in other ways. But what 
the great Christian thinkers have most commonly said is, don't think that evil is what they call a substance, a thing that finds its way into the world. Evil is the workings of the world just going askew. Now, behind that and within that, there lies the active rebellion of created wills against God, which is one way of things going wrong. And why any created intelligence should rebel against God is very mysterious, but, you know, we do it. So if you ask, does God create evil? No. God creates a world which he says is very good, so we're told at the beginning of the Bible. And somehow from that good beginning, things get tangled. We see it right at the beginning of the story. God makes the world, he makes it good, and as soon as things begin to happen, things begin to twist and turn, and what we call evil emerges from that. I hope that satisfies you, viewer. Um, just one, one last, one that, sorry, one, yes, one last thought on that before okay. moving on. Simply to say, in addition to that, of course, because God is God and that never gives up on the world, then however many twists and tangles are created, God has the resource to untangle them and doesn't give up on that either. So just to... You know, so, so there's a redemptive element. Exactly. Even if things look dreadful, even if life is a mess. God remains God. Be Thank you. Thank you. I'm, glad, I'm glad you added that postscript. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's a question about uh, evidence of, of God's existence. Mm. Do you think that God's self-revelation to us is the best proof of his existence? It's certainly the most basic moment for most people, the sense that they are being seen and spoken to and taken seriously. Mm. I don't think that say in the Old Testament, Moses um, encountering God at the burning bush was consulting a set of philosophical arguments. He believed that he was being called into a new life and given the power and resource to live that new life. And the proof, well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the proof was doing it, putting your foot out and finding there's firm ground under it. And the invitation to put your foot out and find firm ground, that's revelation, you might say. It's God, like Jesus walking on the water, reaching out his hand and saying, look, I know this, this looks ridiculous, but could you think about trusting me here? Yeah. And you might find that the ground is firm under your feet. So that, yeah. that's where I see the very heart of revelation. Yeah. On the subject of prayer, how can I tell the difference ask this uh, viewer, how can I tell the difference between a God who is silent mm -hmm. and a God who isn't there? This is a bit Zen, isn't it? Very, very good question. Um, yeah. And if you look at, again, if you look at the history of many of the greatest Christian mystics, people have really gone into the, <clears throat> the deep waters of contemplation and meditation. Mm -hmm. You'll find that th they raise that sort of question. Mm -hmm. I'd say, though, that the the heart of the answer is something like this. I may spend time in prayer having little or no active sense of God's presence. Many great Christian men and women of prayer have found that, but they go, they go through very, very dark periods. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, famously, when her, her journals, her diaries and letters were published after her death, had years and years of feeling that when she prayed, nothing much was happening and she couldn't since anything, anyone there. But, and here's the key thing, God made such triumphant sense of the rest of her life and people saw the work of God in her in a way that it seems made her see her own inner darkness in proportion. All right, I'm not seeing very much of God, but mysteriously, it all seems to coalesce around God. It all makes sense. He wasn't seeing much of God, but other people were seeing God in her or through her. That's right. And, and you know, I think, again, of, of the New Testament stories of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion, saying to his father, take this away from me. I really don't want this. And although St. Luke says an angel appeared ministering to him, the other Gospels are a bit more stark and just say, well, you know, he's, he's left with that desolation. 
But that's the moment when God is most active. And there's a wonderful, wonderful image used by a 20th century Roman Catholic writer who says that sometimes in prayer, we are held so close to God's heart that we can't see his face. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Is there a danger, then, next question, is there a danger of thinking of God as our bell pull in the sky? Mm. This is, you know, pull the cord, the bell rings, God comes running. Yes. There is a danger, I think, and inevitably some of the language we use about prayer can suggest that. We can't always have all these um, ideas balanced in our minds and our hearts, and very often we will talk about God as if all we had to do was uh, yeah. call this emergency number or whatever. But that's where I'd go back to this basic reality. God is never far away. And it's so hard to, to get hold of that. But, you know, there's a Victorian hymn, we need not climb the heavenly steeps to bring the Lord Christ down. In vain we search the lowest deeps for him, no depths can drown. And to go to a completely different world, um, in the Quran, we're told that God is nearer to us than the vein in our neck. St. Augustine in the Christian world says, God is more intimate to me than I am to myself. And I think that's what we have to keep coming back to. God is not at the other end of a long distance that somehow he has to cover to get to us and we have to cover to get to him. They're already in the depths, waiting for us to connect with reality as it, as it is, to be where we are and let that reality be real for us. And, and, and the picture comes to mind, my mind of, of the father in, in, the, in the prodigal son Absolutely. parable. The father is running. The father is running towards his lost child. Yes. yes. So, you know, we need never... Um, fear that you know we are a nuisance or an inconvenience or forgotten exactly exactly and it's it's there in in jewish scripture as well in in isaiah before they call i will answer so yes yeah. the prophet yeah. on this i'm just staying with the subject of prayer mm. and then we'll move but but here's a very personal question uh, rowan this person says i struggle with prayer because I feel it is almost an admission of weakness. Mm -hmm. How should I approach praying? Begin with gratitude. Begin by seeing prayer as just the opportunity to mirror back to God a little bit of the glory and the love that's been shared. But secondly, there's no shame in being a creature as I said, we don't have to be God. We don't have to be in charge of everything. And so acknowledging that we depend on God. You know, I'm not ashamed of depending on the air around me for the fact that I breathe. Yeah. Yeah. So why should I be worried about depending on God for the very energy and life that sustains every moment? And to acknowledge that and to acknowledge it with gratitude and with, yes, with adoration with wonder i think that 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 shifts it a bit from the territory of feeling weakness as if oh i ought to be able to get along with that i ought not to be having yeah. to ask for help yeah. all the time no 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 yeah. not yeah. not that not that just yeah. acknowledging who and what i am yeah there's quite a few questions coming in about covid and, and god um uh, Let's, let's just put a point to, to, to that direction for a moment. Do you think it's possible that the COVID pandemic is a test from God and that we have failed? And if the world worked as one, would we all be in a better position? Well, the latter question is a bit easier than the... the <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> um, and the, you know, the short answer is yes. <laughs> and one of the saddest things in the whole of this tragic business has been the way in which people have reverted to nationalistic and local default settings where they're jealous of one another and competing for resources. Whereas actually, one thing that the pandemic does tell us is we really are in this together. The world is deeply, deeply interconnected and none of us can be safe unless all of us are safe. 
and we can't therefore just say, well, we, we are going to be safe on this tight little island uh, because our security is our neighbor's security. And that's a kind of reflection of what the Bible says, that if any part of the body suffers, everyone suffers. Yes, indeed. So, so that's the easy one. That's What's the, the uh, tough of it? Is this, a, is this a test? Any crisis of this kind, any crisis that makes us think really hard about the kind of world we're in and the world we want is, if we want to see it as such, a test from God. That's to say, it's, it's a moment when we have to declare what matters to us, what kind of beings we want to be. I don't suggest and I don't believe that God deliberately litters history with, as it were, trick questions yeah. and yeah. obstacle courses. But I believe that in, in the world where crises happen and tragedies happen, there is always that opportunity for us to say, now, what have we learned? What are we being asked to change? How are we being asked to grow? And I'm not sure yet that we've fully taken that on board where this pandemic is concerned. People have begun to ask about what they value, what they treasure. They've begun to perhaps question some kinds of individualism, some kinds of materialism, but there's still a long way to go. And I would say with all my heart that one of the tasks that people of faith have in the next year or so will be to make sure those questions are kept firmly on the radar for our society. What have we learned? How, that, how can we grow? That, that leads nicely into the penultimate question. This, this is going to be this one on, on COVID, and then I'm going to talk about images and prayer to conclude. Many, a questioner says, many people are concerned we will exit lockdown and forget what we've learned from it. I'm concerned we'll create an even worse society than the one we left. How can the church contribute to this conversation? What's the, how can Christians speak in to the repairing, the healing, the, the new normal? Yes. Absolutely crucial question. And an absolutely crucial calling, as I suggest, for Christians. And it's not easy because how do we find our way into the public, the public square to talk about these things? Not straightforward. But I think a couple of things we can bear in mind. One is we can, in all our localities, try to give opportunities for people who've been at the forefront, especially in the caring professions, to speak to groups. We can perhaps make sure that churches try to gather people to listen to those who've been working hardest in this and say, no, what, what was it like for you? What do you want to say to the rest of us about that experience? What should we be taking on board? And then there's the much more general thing, which is the church continuing to try to witness to its, its commitment to those who get forgotten. Because COVID has really brought into focus, hasn't it? The people who get forgotten, the people who carry the heaviest loads, whether it's low paid people, people from ethnic minorities, people in the caring professions, the homeless, all of those who've disproportionately suffered. Mm. So the church in the process of coming to the new normal, whatever that means, will need to be very intentional, very careful to maintain and increase its level of commitment there and talk about it. And what people don't always register is of course, the enormous amount that is already being done there. And go to any parish church, any chapel, and not to mention the Salvation Army, Nigel, but you know, who would be remembering many of these people mm. if the church forgot them? Yeah, That's a question indeed. we I indeed. think we need to put. Indeed. Our last question then is about um, prayer and, and, and images. Um, I, I'm putting two together and I'll do it quickly. I struggle with prayer because my mental images of God are always pictures from a children's Bible I used to have. I'm a visual person would like any advice you can give on developing a different mental image of God. And that's linked with, do you, Rowan, have a favourite image for prayer? Hmm. Once again, the second is the easier one. Um, my favourite image is um, that very famous 15th century Russian picture by the Russian icon painter Andrei Rublev 
of the Holy Trinity. Um, mm -hmm. Now, how on earth do you do a picture of the Holy Trinity? Well, the answer is you don't. But in the tradition, especially of the Eastern Church, the three angels who came to visit Abraham in one of the stories in Genesis and who sit round a table with him are seen as a kind of shadow, foreshadowing yeah. Yeah. of the reality of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as the tradition develops, Abraham and Sarah fall out of the picture. And what you have is simply three angels, kind of almost bodiless, very, mm -hmm. very graceful, very um, harmonious figures, just seated around a table. And the, in Greek, that icon, that traditional representation is called literally the hospitality of Abraham, or even more literally, the love of strangers of Abraham. Yeah, nice. So Abraham welcomes God in, in the form of these three angelic visitors. Now, Rublev's Russian picture is, is one of the greatest depictions of this. I have it in the little room I use as a chapel here. And it's always in front of me when I pray. I don't look at it all the time, but I keep it there because it, it's so harmonious and beautiful as a composition. And the shape of the three figures is something almost like a, a cup receiving yeah. something. There's a space into which I can move. And that yeah. may help answer the first question. Yeah. That, that's a picture which doesn't depend on you know, God as a white bearded old man or anything from the Old Testament. It says, here is an image which invites you in to sit mm. around a table with these three mysterious figures. They're slightly differently draped robes and they're very slightly differently angled heads, but you're, you're included in a divine welcome. Mm. And images that help with that, I think, are perhaps what one moves on to from that first stage of just thinking of the, the children's Bible pictures. And also there can be sometimes very abstract images. Some of these um, photographs people put in books of meditation, just of you know, the sun behind clouds and yeah. rain falling. Yeah. Images which tell us there's something here we will never find a photographic image for, but we need to find images that slow us down, calm us down, anchor us, and as I say, welcome us. Roman, thank you so much. You have, through your insights, your intelligence and your spirituality and your faith tonight, you have brought to us the sense of divine welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a privilege to be with you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you.